Hi, everyone. Uh, so my, my camera is not working, so I'm joining Norma's uh, box here. Um, my name is Denise Reckham. I'm here with Norma Francolo. We're both attorneys uh, with Parles Reckham Law Firm in Springfield. Today's webinar is entitled Understanding Your Child's Evaluation. We are so pleased to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Nancy Corral Zebert. She's a founding partner at Positive Developments located in Milburn, New Jersey. Dr. Zebert's current practice focuses on the psychoeducational and neuropsychological assessment of children, adolescents, and young adults. Dr. Zebert earned her undergraduate and doctoral degrees from New York University. She also received extensive training in neuropsychological assessment and psychotherapy at Bellevue Hospital Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital Columbia, Me Columbia Medical Center, where she completed a one-year internship and then worked as a staff and supervising psychologist for several years. Dr. Zebert was a member of the adjunct faculty in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia University, New York Presbyterian Hospital, where she taught psychology interns and psychiatry residents. She continues to teach and supervise psychologists at various stages of their professional development. She also provides individual psychotherapy for children of all ages and young adults, presenting with a variety of emotional, behavioral, and interpersonal difficulties. In addition to her private practice, Dr. Zebert is a consulting psychologist at a local private school. Before we turn the program over to Dr. Zebert, Norma will briefly discuss the importance of having comprehensive evaluation when advocating for your child. And uh, we're going to turn off the cameras now so we can focus on the slides. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So I'm Norma Francolo, and I'm going to just start off with just one slide, um, and the discussion is about the importance of a comprehensive evaluation. Um, if you've been following us this month and uh, during our um, webinar series, we've discussed in the past the, about the importance of an evaluation. Um, evaluation really truly drives the IEP, so if you start off with a poor evaluation or an evaluation that does not really evaluate all areas of needs for your child, you're going to start off with a poor IEP. So an, an evaluation provides the evidence and the roadmap for advocacy for your child's um, needs. And it really helps in understanding why your child's having difficulty in, in school. And it's really critical because that's how you advocate and that's when, how you know what to ask for and how to help your child succeed in and outside of the school. Um, so I'm going to pass this on to Nancy and Nancy you can begin. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be um, joining this webinar and giving this presentation. I absolutely love informing parents and speaking with parents about evaluation and testing it can be a very mysterious confusing anxiety provoking process um, and I like to do everything that I can to <laughs> improve that um, so I wanted to start with um, just uh, the first slide here about um, asking the right questions I feel like this is really the first step in any um, good evaluation next slide please Thank you. Um, so I, I sort of broke it down by, you know, the parents' questions, um, what types of questions an independent evaluator asks, and also what types of questions a child study team asks, because they're not always all the same, although hopefully there's some overlap. Um, so parents usually, you know, when I meet with parents, I'll ask what, what you're hoping to learn about your child. What are your goals for the assessment? What questions do you have? And I also ask why now? So whether um, a child has been evaluated in the past or this is their very first evaluation, I like to understand what's changing now, what's better or worse now. Sometimes parents come because they want to see, you know, how much their child has improved. Sometimes they come because they've been, you know, trying different services, trying different, you know, tutors or, you know, outside services, and they're really f sort of feeling like the child is not making enough improvement or they're still struggling or they're, you know, you know, behaving in a way that shows frustration or, you know, kind of feeling demoralized as a student. So I really like to understand, you know, what's happening now uh, or why parents are, are seeking the evaluation now, what their question is. 
Um, my questions as an independent evaluator um, are to really get, uh, you know, follow the breadcrumbs and try to understand the child's trajectory in terms of where they're coming from developmentally and academically, where they've been, what has their journey been so far, and then also trying to understand where they are right now. So um, a really important part of the evaluation for me is doing all of the detective work um, and getting, you know, a very thorough history from the parents, a thorough history um, by looking at everything that's ever been done. Um, I joke with parents when they bring in big binders of, you know, prior evaluations. I get so excited because I know that I'm going to just really sink my teeth into it and be able to look at everything that's been done. And I have baseline assessments that will inform, you know, trying to understand, like I said, that, that child's journey and sort of where they are now um, developmentally and, and um, educationally. So really, you know, looking at everything, understanding everything, synthesizing it in the final um, analysis and in the final report is time consuming, but incredibly valuable and, and critical, I find. Um, I also like to ask, what are my working hypotheses? What do I think is going on with this child as I begin the evaluation process? Am I suspecting that there's an attentional issue? Am I suspecting that there's dyslexia? So if you've done a good history, you have some clues and some questions in your mind that will then inform um, the third bullet point that I have on here, which is what am I going to do to answer those questions? So I never give a set battery of tests. A lot of times parents will call me and say they need two particular tests or they ask me what tests I'm going to do. And I, I really don't always do the same test. I have a core battery that I certainly like doing and I find useful and I do, you know, many times. But I really have, I feel like I have a lot of, you know, you know, kind of tests in my arsenal and measures that I can pull out um, in getting to know a child and trying to, you know, answer those initial questions that the parents and I had. So the test battery or, you know, if I do a classroom observation or if I'm administering teacher questionnaires or speaking to, you know, the folks that have been working with the student um, really depends on what I need, what data do I need in order to answer those questions. It's always very, you know, driven by what are the questions, what is it that I'm trying to answer. Um, the child's the study team um, differs, I guess, a little bit. It depends on the child's study team how much they'll share these questions that I have, um, how they kind of approach the assessment, how they build their test battery really varies by child study team. But one important difference is that the child study team very often, possibly always, um, has a primary question of understanding eligibility. So they're asking, they're doing, you know, often the same measures or the same, you know, parent interview and working with the parents and all of that. But their criteria, it's a, it's a yes or no question, is the child eligible? Does the child need services? So that's a question that um, is certainly, you know, in my mind um, as an independent evaluator, but that sort of, you know, eighth on the list of eight questions, um, because my top seven questions have to do with understanding what, what is going on with this child first and foremost, informing the parents, giving feedback to the child, um, explaining it in a way to everyone that makes sense, and then thinking about what is it that the child needs, and then part of that process is understanding what they might be eligible for in school. So, so it's a real, you know, kind of distant last or near, you know, near to last question. Um, whereas for the child study team, that's, you know, one of their main jobs is to figure out if a child is eligible or not according to their um, uh, classification criteria. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what I wanted to do is just kind of give you an overview of the all the possible areas of assessment. I shouldn't say all, maybe these aren't all the <laughs> possible areas of assessment, but these are the ones that I know about and, and kind of, you know, understand in my work. Um, and these, you, you know, you can read the slide. These are all the different categories of assessment um, that are, that you'll typically see in a report. They are not all covered in every evaluation. That's really important to understand. So you can have one or four or all of these categories covered in a child study team or independent evaluation. It really, really varies. Um, in my assessments, I cover all of these. I feel like they're all important. There's not one that I would, you know, put over another as, as more or less important. So I look at all of these areas. And the way that I think about um, an assessment is, or a neuropsychological assessment, because parents often, you know, have a question about how does that differ from an educational assessment. Um, my, my analogy is that um, 
you know, it is an iceberg. And so what I'm thinking about is if you, you know, visualize an iceberg in your mind, um, the top of the iceberg that sticks out above the water um, is a small part of the iceberg. And those are um, academic skills and social functioning and, you know, some of the outward manifestations of behavior. Um, so those are the things that you kind of see in your daily life. And, you know, reading, writing, and math are sort of that, you know, that tip of the iceberg. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at an educational assessment. What's underneath the surface of the water and the real huge piece of the iceberg is all of these underlying brain functions. How does a child press, process language? What are their attention and executive functioning skills? What are their fine and gross motor skills? How does their memory work? What's going on emotionally? Um, what are their, you know, social information processing skills look like? So really, and intellectual ability falls within that as well in terms of understanding verbal and nonverbal thinking, and we'll get into that a little bit more, but really trying to understand, you know, that that bottom of the iceberg is the tools in their toolkit. You know, those are the tools that a child brings to school with them that makes them able to learn academic information. So the academic skills are important. That's the part that you see and you should absolutely assess them. But then there's all these other, you know, brain functions underneath the surface that you really need to understand um, in order to understand how that child is going to be able to succeed in school and do their best. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, before I go on to talking about all of these areas, this is a source of tremendous confusion for parents, and so I just wanted to kind of take a moment to explain it, you know, as best I can. Again, it's not, not every child study team evaluates kids in exactly the same way, but this is a general sort of lay of the land and the, the different lingo that's used in a private evaluation and a child study team evaluation. So in the first category, there's the same categories that I had on the prior slide. Um, in terms of these categories, um, the first category, intellectual ability, um, I find is a, it's a confusing, you know, uh, word. Um, they call it a, the child study team calls it a psychological evaluation, um, and it's typically com completed by a school psychologist. That's probably why it's called a psychological evaluation. The reason that term is confusing to me is because I feel like it's all psychological. So I'm I'm looking at all of these parts, and it's all a psychological evaluation. But um, so sometimes parents get confused by that. But generally, the psychological evaluation is the IQ test. That's a measure of intellectual ability. Um, and sometimes the school psychologist will come back to this later, but will also include, you know, other measures um, to look at, you know, more psychological kinds of um, factors. They might do a classroom observation. So that's not all that they do, but the IQ test in a child study team is in your psychological evaluation. That's what it's called. Um, academic skills are the educational evaluation, which is typically completed by a learning specialist um, who is a member of the child study team. Language processing um, is the speech and language evaluation completed by a speech pathologist on the team. Attention and executive functioning is not always assessed. Um, so this is sort of a tricky one because it really, really varies depending on the team and their approach. Um, sometimes it's included in the psychological evaluation or parts of it are. Um, I do not see a lot of formal testing in executive in the area of executive functioning by child study teams generally. Um, I do sometimes see a questionnaire here or there, but I don't see the administration of executive functioning tests. Um, again, it varies, but just in my clinical experience, um, that's not something I'm seeing a lot of. Um, and then sometimes when there's a question of attention executive functioning, the district will refer out to one of their um, psychiatrists or neurologists who they work with and collaborate with. And um, usually, but not always, that's a question, you know, if they have a question of ADHD, which the child study team, um, you know, won't be able to really medically assess or, or diagnose, um, they want input from that outside physician in terms of, you know, whether or not there's ADHD as part of the picture. Um, so that's usually, you know, a psychiatrist or neurologist who will do that portion um, on behalf of the child study team. Um, Finding gross motor skills are evaluated by an occupational therapist and or a physical therapist, depending on, you know, lots of factors, but those are the, the two professionals who usually do that part of the assessment. Uh, memory, again, I don't typically see memory tests being administered. Um, I feel like memory is tested by child study teams even less frequently than executive functioning. Um, I actually can't remember in the past 15 or 16 years of working in New Jersey that I've seen any memory testing done, so I, I, I imagine it's pretty rare, but it's totally possible that I just haven't come across one uh, that included that. 
Um, and then the final category, I just kind of put everything into this one place, behavioral, sensory, emotional, and personality functioning. It's a very, very big category um, and can look like lots of different, you know, uh, permutations in terms of an assessment. But this will basically be either, you know, briefly included in the psychological evaluation alongside the IQ test, or it will be... Um, uh, conducted by an outside psychiatrist. Um, I've seen, you know, many child study teams um, do this where there's, you know, just a very complex psychiatric picture um, and they do bring in outside psychiatrists who will write, you know, a very detailed report and do a good job um, understanding all the different variables um, that are going on, you know, emotionally and behaviorally for a student. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so before we get into the various areas of assessment and what those portions of the testing look like, I wanted to take a moment to um, explain something else that tends to be very confusing for parents, which is um, what standardized scores mean or standard scores. So um, this is a normal curve, and this is basically what all or most of the standardized measures um, will be scored. Uh, against. So um, on all, you know, testing measures that I use, um, they've, you know, uh, will give the measure at, at when it's being designed and, and normed. They'll give the test after it's designed to thousands of kids in what's called the, the uh, uh, norm sample. So this is a standardization sample of students. And they test kids of all ages that are covered by the test. And they test, you know, geographically, you know, generally um, using varied areas across the country. So um, once all those kids are tested, they statistically plot them into this normal curve. They remove any outliers that fall outside of the curve, and they, uh, you know, do lots of different statistical things that I can't remember from graduate school statistics. Um, but basically, the important thing to know here is that 68% of kids tested will fall between this 80, the shaded area, the 85 to 115 standard score. So a standard score of 100 is exactly average. It's at the 50th percentile, which means that 50% of kids will do, you know, did better on that test and 50% of kids did worse on that test. So 100 is the kid who's right smack in the middle and then 68% of their same age or same grade peers will get a score of 85 to 115. So when you look at the normal curve and your child gets a normal, you know, IQ score or an average IQ score, I'm sorry, an average IQ score or an average score on a reading test or an average score on a math test, really what it means is that average is really average. They are in the majority of students, 68%, who fall within that shaded area. Okay, so average is fine, that's <laughs> a point I wanted to make. Um, and then the other point that I wanted to make is that you'll see that everyone who's above 115 or below 85, that's a really small group of kids, um, especially the above 130 range or the below 70 range. It's only 2% on either end. So a lot of times, you know, parents will come in and say um, that they were, you know, tested as a child and their IQ was 152 and how does, you know, why does their child have an IQ of 90? What's wrong with them? Or, you know, a teenager will tell me they took an IQ test online and their IQ was 157 and how come, you know, what does that mean that there's, you know, super genius? Those scores on an actual IQ test are in incredibly rare. Um, you can see really only goes up to 145 on this chart and anything above 130 is only 2% of, you know, anyone who took the test. So There's very few kids in that, in that um, little pocket of scores. Um, okay, so I wanted to also explain here that um, on an IQ test and on many other tests, um, a score of average is, it's not 85 to 115, it's a score between 90 and 109 is considered average. And then um, below 90 is low average, and then the farther down you go, there's you know different classifications, labels for it, depending on the test. Um, and then on an IQ test, again, 110 to 119 is high average, 120 and above, you, know, you start to get into really high, um, high scores um, and different you know, labels, depending on the test. Um, and this is the same for um, the educational testing. It's the same, generally the same range of scores uh, that are considered average. Um, there is also, uh, I wanted to also mention um, grade-based versus age-based norms. So um, all of these tests, when you get a score, it's um, your child's performance relative to same age peers if they used, if the evaluator used age-based norms. And um, it's, the standard score is derived from um, 
a comparison to same grade peers if they use grade-based norm. So on something like an IQ test is always age-based norms. So you are compared to other nine-year-olds if you're nine or other 10-year-olds if you're 10. On educational testing, um, evaluators have the option of using a grade-based norm or an age-based norm. And this sometimes com comes into play in terms of um, educational questions because, um, for example, someone might be very old or very young for their grade. So an age-based comparison might not be the best way to look at it. Um, that at that point, it's really uh, more helpful to look at grade-based norms because we want to know how they compare to other kids in their grade who've been exposed to the same amount and type of, of um, academic work at that point in time. Um, another thing that I wanted to say before we, we move on from this um, statistics crash course <laughs> is that um, what percentiles mean. So I mentioned before 50th percentile means that 50% of kids did better than your child, 50% of kids did worse on the standardization sample. So this is not kids in New Jersey who just took the test. This is not New Jersey norms. This is everyone who took the test whenever the test was created and they originally standardized it. So if it's an old test, you might be getting compared to, um, you know, kids in 1986. <laughs> so it's important to look at, you know, is it an updated test? How, how long ago were the norms updated? Um, and keeping in mind that there is lots of geographic variability in terms of how kids perform. Um, in New Jersey, there's lots of intelligent people, lots of intelligent students, lots of, you know, high, high demands for curriculum and, uh, you know, mastery. So um, sometimes parents will say to me, well, is it average for, you know, Milburn or Short Hills or is it average for Livingston? And, you know, it's a good question. I mean, you really have to think about um, the child in their context when you're trying to interpret these um, standardized scores um, using this, you know, kind of random uh, norming sample of kids that was used. Um, so percentiles, again, if you're, let, just to take another example, if your child is at the 90th percentile on a test, um, it means that they have mastered that skill or can, or have an ability that is stronger than 90% of kids their age who took the test. And if they're at the 20th percentile, it means that they're only, you know, better at that skill or ability than 20% of kids their age. So obviously it's a big difference. And then last but not least, that average range is really big. So um, even though 68% of kids fall between 85 and 115, there is a real big difference in terms of what a child can do in their daily life if a score in a, in a particular area is a 115 versus if a score is an 85, even though technically they might both be average or near average, um, you do have to look at those variabilities within that, um, you know, kind of average section of the normal curve. Okay, next slide, please. All right, um, so I wanted to kind of go through each area, and um, I got a lot of questions about um, IQ testing, so this is, we start out with bigger slides and then they'll go <laughs> shorter and faster as we go on. Um, so I wanted to spend some time on this and also on the educational um, uh, at the academic skills uh, portion of the assessment. So these, these two will be kind of my primary focus. Um, common tests that are used for uh, measuring intellectual abilities are the family of Wexler tests. So this is kind of the you know, gold standard. Um, they're very well researched, well standardized. They've been around forever. Um, and they're constantly updated and improved upon. Um, there's just a you know, kind of world of research and thought put into um, these tests. So they're, they're pretty you know, solid and valid and useful measures um, of what they measure. So they're limited like any test is, but they are um, you know, reliable measures. Um, so they have cute nicknames, um, but this is what they stand for. So the uh, Wexler Preschool and Primary Scale is known as the WIPSI, um, and that goes up to age six. The Wexler Intelligence Scale, scale for Children is known as the WISC, um, and that's a popular one because it covers a big age range, six to 15. And the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale starts at age 16 and goes through adulthood. So um, those are the, you know, WIPSI, WISC, and WACE. Those are ones that you'll hear a lot. Um, about. Um, the areas that are assessed on most IQ tests um, on this list, that, you know, most of these three tests will um, cover, you know, most of these areas. Um, verbal reasoning and visual spatial reasoning are always part of the assessment. Um, so verbal reasoning is thinking with words and visual spatial reasoning is thinking with images and pictures. Um, fluid reasoning is um, a newer index, which is now included on the WISC-5. Um, it's not on every single 
Wexler test, but it's it's the idea behind it is that it measures your ability to think on your feet and kind of solve problems. Um, the tests happen to be visual spatial, so they're, they're problem solving tests and being able to kind of think flexibly and, and problem solve using the visual information that you have. Um, it's another you know measure of thinking ability. Um, and then working memory and processing speed are not um, necessarily thinking tests, but they are parts of your brain functioning that you need in order to do a variety of tasks. So working memory is um, your ability to hold information in your mind while you're doing something with it. So doing mental math, for example, or remembering something just long enough while you're trying to, you know, kind of find a piece of paper and jot it down before you forget it. Um, and that is very sensitive to attentional control. Um, and processing speed is your ability to work quickly, but it's important to know that on the IQ test, none of these tests are necessarily um, academic in nature. Um, they're meant to be just, you know, uh, thinking tests um, or processing tests. So um, processing speed is not how fast you read or how fast you do math. It's how fast you do target detection on a very simple visual attention test. Um, so when you see a low processing speed score, yes, it's something that, you know, can tell us about your child, but it's not the be all and end all of what they can do, you know, on a variety of other time tests. Um, it's just what they can do on these particular two tests. Um, generally, they're administered, sometimes three. Um, and in terms of the academic piece, um, I shall come back to that. Um, so in terms of these indices, these five, I'm using the five indices that are on the WISC because that's the test that most of you will be um, probably familiar with if you've had your child evaluated. So um, the one thing to mention is that um, when you're looking at the overall full scale IQ, it includes how you're, it's in basically an average of how your child did in all five of these areas. Um, there is an alternative measure of overall intellectual ability called the general ability index, which is not always computed, but it should be computed when there's a lot of variability between this um, indices, and especially when a child struggles with working memory and processing speed, but they did well in the other areas or they performed differently in the other areas, the general ability index looks at the first three areas assessed, which are the thinking areas of the test, and it removes working memory and processing speed. So when you remove you know, kids who need a little extra time processing information or kids who have poor working memory or attentional issues, you get the score that says more about how, you know, intelligent you are in general in terms of um, thinking ability and reasoning with words and pictures. Um, the IQ tests I mentioned before, they generally don't include academic work, but IQ scores are impacted by academic learning um, and therefore learning disabilities can impact IQ scores. Um, a really, uh, you know, kind of obvious and glaring example of that. There are many, but a really big example of that is that on the verbal reasoning um, subtests of the WISC, um, one of the tests requires kids to define vocabulary words. It's not reading or writing. It's not academic work in the way that they're used to seeing at school. But if a child has a reading disorder or they've had, you know, learning issues and have, you know, struggled in school, their vocabulary will not be as strong as somebody who has been um, doing really well in literacy and has built a really good vocabulary through lots of reading. So um, that is, you know, a very clear impact of on that verbal IQ test of um, a learning disability. Um, and related to this IQ scores, you know, parents sometimes feel that um, IQ is, you know, you, you, it's a bucket and however much you have in that bucket, that's how much you're going to have your whole life. Um, and that's not true. You know, the, the IQ tests are limited in what they're looking at and IQ scores can and do change over time. Um, when kids are tested at a young age, that score tends to change you know, as they're developing. So if you give an IQ test at age four, and then you give the same child an IQ test at age 10, those scores are often um, different. They just look different because a lot of has happened between those ages in terms of their um, cognitive development. Um, and especially if a child receives, you know, remediation or therapeutic interventions, those scores can really change. Um, and again, it, you know, influenced by learning disabilities. So in my earlier example, if you take a child with a reading disorder and you remediate the reading disability and now they have a real love of reading and they read voraciously, their vocabulary is absolutely going to improve and they're going to get a higher verbal reasoning score on the IQ test and then their full skill IQ will be higher. So it really does um, vary. And there's, you know, lots of examples of things that can influence an IQ score uh, moving up or down with age. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to mention that's not on this slide, but is really an important point across um, all of the tests that we'll be talking about, uh, or all of the areas of assessment that we'll be talking about, is that there's generally um, a composite score 
like the five areas assessed here, those are all index scores or the full skill IQ and the um, GAI, those are both um, index scores. Um, or, you know, overall composite scores. So those are all, whenever you, you have a composite score, it's an average of a child's performance, for, performance on more than one subtest. So it's really important to look at the individual subtest scores. Um, it's really, really important diagnostically. It's important in terms of understanding if there's a discrepancy or a learning disability or a particular weakness in one area. So for example, a child could have a score of 85 on the verbal reasoning IQ score and on the visual spatial uh, spatial reasoning um, IQ score. When you look at the different subtests on the verbal reasoning scale, they had, you know, the same exact um, scaled score on each subtest. When you look at visual spatial reasoning, they did great on two of the subtests and really poorly on a third. They'll have the same overall composite score, but obviously something's going on visual spatially for that child where they have some, you know, real areas of strength um, that are being pulled down in that score by the one thing that was really, really hard for them on that index. So it's incredibly important to look at the individual subtest scores and to know what you're looking for and to know what those tests measure so that you can accurately and correctly interpret what that might mean, that the um, variability um, across the different subtests. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the assessment of academic skills is another major area of assessment. Um, common tests that you'll see here uh, in this area, and again on the child study team evaluation, it's um, the educational evaluation um, section of the assessment. Um, so the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement are pretty commonly used. That's the test that I typically use. The Wexler individual achievement test is um, sometimes used. The Gray oral reading test is used. The Nelson-Denny reading test. Um, I left one out that's important that I really like and use a lot, the test of written language, um, the TOWL, T-O-W-L. So that's another useful measure of writing. Um, and there's, you know, key math for math and, you know, all kinds of other smaller tests that you can get into. But these are the ones that you'll see um, most often. Uh, the areas assessed in an academic or educational evaluation are reading, writing, and math. Um, generally, most evaluators do not get into science, history, and social studies. Um, the idea here is to look at those fundamental academic skills and how a child is developing those skills. And are they on grade level? Are they near grade level? Are they, you know, at the level that they should be for how smart they are? Um, so, those, you know, reading, writing, math is what's typically looked at. Um, in these areas, it's really, really critical to obtain a robust, rich assessment of each skill area using lots of different tests. So, for example, with reading, you can't just do a reading test or you can't do three reading tests and look at the overall, you know, broad reading score on a Woodcock-Johnson. You have to look at what's happening within those reading areas that are assessed. You have to give lots of different tests so you can fully understand what this experience of reading is for a child. Um, so, for example, looking at differences between decoding, are they phonetically decoding words? Do they have good phonics, you know, understanding of phonics and good, quote, word attack skills where they can see an unfamiliar word and sound it out in a way that maybe isn't correct, but is at least a good, a good effort and they sort of understand how the word is constructed and are making a good approximation. Um, what's their fluency like? Are they able to read decode well, but they're really slow when they read? Um, what is their comprehension like? Maybe they sound beautiful when they read, but then you take the page away and they have no idea what they read, no understanding, can't retell, um, you know, can't give the information back on um, tests. And then you have to also look at how that comprehension is being measured. Um, is it a fill in the blank test? Is it a multiple choice test? Um, those are really important differences to uh, look at when you're trying to understand how a child's um, daily reading experience um, works for them or, or where they're um, hindered. Um, and same for writing and math, you really need to look very carefully at each of those areas. Um, in terms of identifying a learning disability, um, there are lots of different opinions about how to do it and sort of what constitutes uh, a significant enough um, impairment or delay or discrepancy. Um, but basically the two main ways to think about it are, um, is the child on grade level? So if a child is two years below their grade level peers on reading measures, they probably have a learning disability, um, although maybe not necessarily. Maybe they primarily have a language processing disorder. Maybe they've had interruptions to their early education where they just are trying to catch up. 
Um, maybe they have overall cognitive impairments that are keeping them from being able to learn how to read. So um, could be a learning disability, but it, it might not be necessarily a pure learning disability. Um, so the child being on grade level is one thing to look at. And then the other thing to look at is if the child is learning at a level that is commensurate with his or her overall intellectual ability. Um, so are they learning up to their potential? Um, they might be on grade level, but they might be, you know, brilliantly intelligent. And so just being on grade level still shows a 30 or 40 point discrepancy between where they should be given how smart they are um, or how advanced their, you know, verbal skills are and how sophisticated they are as thinkers outside of school. Um, so there are certainly limitations of using a discrepancy model of learning disabilities. It is um, something that the child study teams definitely rely on um, generally. Um, it is not my favorite way of trying to understand learning disabilities. Um, one example of a limitation is what I said earlier in terms of, you know, the discrepancy between the child's own potential. So um, the district's job basically is to have your child learn at a great appropriate level. Um, however, parents will often come to me because they see that they're struggling, you know, the child is struggling at home and they have a, you know, verbal IQ of, you know, 120 and they, they're, you know, verbal expression is, is amazing and they're, you know, putting all these abstract thoughts together in their daily life and they're just, you know, clearly a brilliant, you know, very intelligent child and then they resist reading or they, you know, they just uh, don't want to read out loud in front of their classmates or, you know, there's just all of these issues around reading and so when you test them on standardized tests, they look like they're on grade level, you know, they seem like they're fine, um, but that, you know, discrepancy um, is there and suggests that, you know, that there's something's going on. So that's, that's an example, I guess, of a good use of the discrepancy model, um, but not in terms of a discrepancy between, a ch you know, the child and their same grade peers. Um, and another example is if a child has an IQ of 80 and all of their academic skills are also at an 80, um, it doesn't mean that that child's not having trouble learning. They, of course, need support and um, remediation, um, but there's no discrepancy. So technically, um, some could say that there isn't a, you know, learning disability because there's no discrepancy. Um, so those, you know, obviously uh, there are times when the discrepancy model works and times when the discrepancy model does not work. So you have to look at it from all different angles. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, and one more thing that I'll say about the discrepancy model, you can go ahead to the next slide, but um, I also wanted to say, to reiterate again, the importance of looking at those individual subtest scores. I kind of alluded that, to that a little bit in terms of um, reading. And then I also want to, uh, you know, to pay attention to what sc scores are being used to calculate a discrepancy. So if you're trying to identify a reading disorder, you might use just the verbal IQ score instead of the full scale IQ score. Um, in trying to identify a math disability, you might use the full scale IQ score or you might use the visual spatial IQ score. Um, so the discrepancy can be there in lots of different ways. It just depends on, you know, knowing how to read the tea leaves and trying to understand what exactly is going on in this child's um, cognitive and learning um, profile. Okay, so I will zip through these a little bit more quickly so that we have time for um, conversation and discussion. Um, language processing, these are generally the areas that are assessed um, with language processing in, or in, with a language evaluation. Receptive and expressive language is the input and output of language. Um, articulation is uh, often what people think about when they think about speech and language therapy. Um, it's just your mouth's ability to pronounce letters and sounds. Um, so it is absolutely not the full extent of a speech and language evaluation. It's probably just a tiny little portion of <laughs> speech and language uh, functioning. Um, other areas are um, auditory processing, which I know parents you know, know about and have questions about and is a whole topic um, in and of itself. And also pragmatic language, which refers to social communication and the practical applications of language in daily life. These are all super, super important areas. I don't have time to get into it more, but um, I'm a huge uh, proponent of really understanding a child's language processing skills in all areas. It affects every aspect of their day. Um, kids are being talked at and expected to speak all day long in the classroom, on the playground, with their parents, with their friends. Um, it is pretty much everything that we do in our society is verbally driven. So it's really, really important to have a good understanding of language processing. Um, and it's not always apparent that there is a language processing issue. So I really try to um, emphasize that in my evaluations. Attention executive functioning is another area that I could spend <laughs> lots of time talking about. Um, I just included some bullet points here um, in terms of the areas that fall under attention and executive functioning. Um, 
these things I, I wanted to get into, you know, executive functioning, what is it, how does it present across um, the lifespan, there's so many questions that parents have about executive functioning, um, but we're not going to have time, and then also understanding um, not just, you know, getting an ADHD diagnosis and ADHD being, you know, kind of a yes or no question, yes, a child has it, no, they don't, um, that's not really that useful um, to know. I think that the really useful uh, information comes from understanding how, how severe is it, what is the impact on their learning, what is their impact on different areas of learning. Maybe a child is a complete whiz at math and they can focus like gangbusters on math, but then when they sit down to read, which requires more effort and attentional control, then that ADHD really derails their reading fluency or their stamina or their comprehension or makes them more resistant to reading. Um, same with executive functioning. Maybe their backpack is really well organized, but when they sit down in front of a blank page, they can't organize all of the steps, you know, or an outline to kind of create a written product from a blank page. Um, so executive functioning can really impact kids at different ages in different ways. Um, fine and gross motor skills and sensory processing is another huge category. It's really important to look at these um, areas of difficulty, uh, potential areas of difficulty. If you can't hold a pencil, that's a really obvious example of how fine motor skills are going to derail your whole day. Um, it's going to be extremely frustrating for kids to have to do fine motor tasks like holding a pencil or even operating an iPad if they're using you know, technology in the classroom, um, using manipulatives in math. I mean, there's lots of ways where fine motor skills can derail a child. Um, gross motor skills as well, sensory processing, their ability to sit in a room all day and listen and sit still and do all of these sensory and motor tasks that they're required to do can be very challenging uh, and impact stamina um, and lead to frustration and behavioral issues and all kinds of other things. Okay, next slide please. I'm zooming through here now. So these are a few other areas. Um, I'm not going to have time to talk too much about memory um, and behavioral, emotional, social, personality functioning is a colossal category, <laughs> just sort of put everything in here. This is basically where psychiatric issues would fall, behavior disorders, um, any sort of, you know, social challenges. I mean, things that are, uh, uh, you know, interfering with the kid's ability to kind of get through their school day um, in various ways in their learning. Um, in terms of memory, um, I can, you know, talk more about that if anyone has a question, but it's important to look at visual and verbal memory and trying to understand, you know, kid, young kids generally have a good memory, um, unlike those of us who are older and <laughs> starting to fail a little bit, um, but generally um, kids have a good memory. It's just a question of how is the information getting into their brain, how well is it being recorded, depending on how it got in there, and then are they able to retain it over time and then, and then express it, um, you know, on paper or verbally to show mastery of content um, in school. Um, and then obviously attentional issues can really derail learning in a variety of ways, um, encoding that um, information in their mind is, uh, you know, really requires sustained attention and focus. If they're not listening or paying attention, you know, it's not going to get in there. Um, okay, so moving on to the next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, results and recommendations. This is the last slide, so I'm just going to spend a minute on this, and then we can um, certainly, you know, have it, uh, discuss any questions that come up about this. Um, so the most important thing I feel to come from an evaluation is the results and recommendations. And a lot of times, parents um, walk away from a verbal feedback session with an independent evaluator, and they they can't explain what the conclusions were. Um, although they'll go to a child study team meeting and they're so overwhelmed by all of the professionals in the room and they're so anxious and you know they, they don't feel like an expert in the room although they really want to advocate for their child they don't feel like they can really kind of understand all of the ins and outs of the results of the data or you know kind of what the conclusions are that are being made. I feel like it's imperative um, for the evaluator to have that parent walk away from whatever the feedback session was, whether it was a child study team meeting or an individual, you know, feedback set, an independent evaluator's feedback session, the parents should walk away and be able to go home and say to their spouse or their neighbor, hey, guess what I learned today about my child, and be able to explain it. <laughs> so if you can't do that, it means that the evaluator did not present the results in a way that made sense to you, um, and ultimately you can't advocate for your child or support them at home if you don't understand what all of the data and reports mean. Um, a lot of times parents have, you know, huge pile of reports and they they just sit there and gather dust. 
Um, and the report, the written report should really be an action plan. It should include lots of recommendations, uh, but not excessive recommendations. It should be a non-overwhelming action plan where, you know, the parent feels like, okay, I'm going to focus on these five or six strategies or, you know, services in the next year. And a year from now, I'm going to take a look at this child again and see have they made progress in those areas that we were working on. So doing a, you know, pre and post assessment. So there's accountability. Um, a lot of times services are discontinued either privately or in school. You know, parents will be told that, speech and language is done, they're all better. Um, and you don't have a kind of an exit testing, you don't have an exit assessment of, you know, standardized testing where you can tell that that child really did actually make progress and they are all better. Um, so it's really important to sort of think about what those recommendations are, if the services are working, um, and, ha you know, have a solid understanding of all of the different parts of the evaluation. Um, and last but not least, I'll leave with the idea that um, it's really hard to decipher all of those reports on your own. Um, and so one thing that I really, really enjoy doing because this is just a passion of mine is to help parents understand and you know navigate the world of um, testing is to just bring your pile of reports and consult with a psychologist who does testing. Um, you know, one-time visit can leave you feeling really uh, much more clear um, and organized in terms of your synthesis of the results. Um, and that person can also guide you in terms of recommendations, what's more or less important, what makes sense in terms of the services at school, what can you do um, outside privately um, if you're interested in private services. Um, so you really can, you know, kind of want to uh, consult with someone uh, when in doubt or when you're not feeling like you have a solid understanding of the evaluation. Um, oh, and one more thing that I wanted to mention that the uh, private evaluators um, uh, you know, goal is to really understand the clinical picture and understand if there's a, a diagnosis there or to understand clinically what's going on with the child. Um, the child study team meeting is often again about eligibility and whether or not a child can be classified as needing special services. So those are two different things that come out of those feedback sessions that can be a, a very different experience for parents. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Um, so, thank you so much. What, we can put the cameras back on so you can see us again. Okay. Okay. So, thank you so much uh, to Nancy for that uh, amazing explanation. I, I know I always learn a lot when I listen to you. We are going to uh, start reading the questions. Okay. So, um, the first question is is the intelligence score fixed or a point in time measure? I think you started you talked about that a little bit, but it's not yeah. fixed, right, Nancy? Yeah. It's not fixed, um, and I think there's two things. One is that parents um, and you know professionals often place a lot of emphasis on the IQ score, so they really get focused on, on wanting that score to go up, <laughs> which is understandable. Um, but that you know one thing is that it's not necessarily all that important to have an overall IQ score um, that's higher or you know better. Um, one thing that I look at when I'm making that determination about whether or not it's really indicating something problematic is um, I want to see what the how the child is functioning. So I've seen kids who have an IQ of 85 and their academic skills are in the one teens, you know, 112, 115, 116. That kid's going to be fine. They're reading, writing, and doing math, you know, at an excellent level. Um, they're probably working really hard and it probably doesn't come easily to them, but they're doing it. So I feel like, um, you know, there, there's that piece of it. And then also with the IQ scores, like I said, there's tons of things that can influence a child's performance on an IQ test. An IQ test is administered usually one day. So it's a snapshot in time of how that child did that day on these particular 12 or 13 tests. Um, the tests are limited and it's just a snapshot in time. So there's meaningful information to be gleaned from those scores, but it's not the be all and end all of a child, you know, what a child's going to be doing when they're 30. Okay, so the next question is, how would parents know the test school, the test that schools picked are the right tests? Um, is that also another kind of question? Yeah, for the, so, okay. yeah, so it's for, the, for the triennial. So every three years, the school is going to be um, testing. testing the student, and how can the parents know that the tests that were picked are the right tests, and is there a reference okay. guide that a, can, a parent can use to help them know what tests should be provided? 
Right. Um, I'm not sure if there's a reference guide. There might be one online somewhere. I can, you know, you can Google anything these days and find an answer. But um, I feel like that's a really hard question for parents to answer or to know, know the answer to without outside consultation. Um, it takes a lot of, you know, experience testing thousands of kids before you really know what test is going to get at the, you know, question you have about your child. Um, so, and, and often I find that um, when parents are frustrated by the evaluation or walk away feeling like something's not right, it had to really do with the evaluator's test selection. So I often, when I do consultations, one of my most common, you know, pieces of feedback to parents is go back to the child study team, ask them to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so that's a, that's a huge problem. A, an obvious example of that is, um, I come across all the time, is on the Woodcock-Johnson, the writing tests are really discrete short writing tests. On one test they're asked to write sentences um, within a time limit. On another test they're asked to spell words not in context, just a regular old spelling test. And then on the third test they're asked to write, um, you know, sentences in response to particular prompts, but they're just sentences. Um, and spelling doesn't even count on that test. So um, if you don't do an open-ended writing test where a kid has to write a story for 15 or 20 minutes, um, you're not going to see the frustration or the challenges that they might be experiencing in writing. Um, so that's a test that I, you know, often say, go back to the district, that's, you know, ask them to do this test and let's see what those scores look like. Um, but there's no way that a parent would know all the tests that are out there and all the tests and, you know, what they measure. Um, one thing that you could do um, along the lines of Googling, sometimes, you know, Dr. Google gives you, you know, misinformation, but you could Google the tests that were administered, um, read a description of the test. You know, was that reading test, was it timed? Did it measure decoding? Did it measure comprehension? Um, you know, what, what was the content of the test? So when you're interpreting the scores with the team and kind of looking at what they assessed, it, often the problem is not in what they did, it's in what they left out. Um, so you want to see, you know, well, that comprehension test that you gave him was only reading sentences. How about reading a story? What's his comprehension like then? Um, and so you might do a, a longer reading test or a sustained reading test. Um, so if you know what's in the test that they did, you'll kind of know, you know, what's missing. Okay. The next question is, um, the WIPC-4, is, is it an appropriate test for a seven and a half year old boy? Um, I don't think it goes up that far, no. Um, what is the difference between Woodcock-Johnson form A, B, or C? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so the difference is basically just to provide an alternate measure because you can't, you shouldn't repeat tests within a certain time limit because the kid might, you know, I've never seen this happen, but they might actually remember some of the test items or really curious kids will go home and, you know, kind of ask their parents the answers and if they had a burning question in their mind when they left the testing session. So um, like form A and B might be used when form A was administered by an independent evaluator and the child study team wants to repeat their tests and have their own learning specialist see that kid in action, hear them reading, you know, watch them doing math, so they'll do form B. So it's the same uh, structure of the test, but the um, individual items are different. Oh, okay. Okay, that sounds um, for us. Yes, <laughs> um, what do you do if the district rejects your evaluation? I think that's right. more of a question that's for That's more of a legal question. So the, the, the district does not have to accept your evaluation. They have to consider your evaluation. But, you know, on a practical sense, if, if you have an evaluation from Dr. Zebert that says your child has dyslexia and needs all of these services. They can say, oh, you know, well, we considered that, but we disagree, and they're not going to give that to you. But they better have some other, you know, information that supports their disregarding of it. They can't, you know, they, they can't just disregard it because they don't feel like accepting it. They, they, they can say, well, we have our testing, which we disagree with her findings and we're going to do it a different way. But if you play that out as we would in a, you know, in a, uh, a court of law, a judge is going to say, okay, you had this, you know, 25 page report with three pages of uh, recommendations and it, uh, this child was clearly struggling and you ignored the recommendations and that's not going to fly, you know? So it is true that many parents come in and this child study was, team will say, well, you know, we, we don't have to accept those recommendations. We just have to consider them and we don't agree. You know, that, that's, that's flimsy on their side. That's not going to fly uh, when a judge is asking them why didn't they, why didn't they provide those, uh, that remediation that was being recommended. So, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, it's a difficult answer because they don't have to accept it, but they, 
they ignore it at their own risk. Let's put it that way. And I can just say in my own experience, like not from the legal side, um, I rarely have my entire report um, rejected. I feel like that's happened maybe twice in 15 years. Um, and it didn't end well for the district. Um, <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, usually they'll, they'll disagree with uh, pieces of it or they might disagree with a conclusion about a learning disability. And again, that gets into, you know, well, you know, what's my diagnosis of a learning disability versus their eligibility criteria for a disability. Um, so that it gets into a little bit, you know, the difference between what they're looking for and what I'm looking for. But generally, I don't find that the entire report is rejected. I find it difficult when the school's responsibility to work uh, to getting to be at level, but how can I push the school to support my kid to getting him to his level? Yeah, that's a great that's great a great question. question because we we talk about that also a lot that the school district will come back and say, well, this child in third grade is reading at a third grade level, and meanwhile all the peers are reading at, you know, on a similar kind of test would be reading at a seventh grade level. You know, what is that grade level? It's a national norm that doesn't necessarily hold for, I think, you know, Nancy touched on this a little bit in your, in your main presentation. It doesn't necessarily hold for the, the child sitting next to them or, you know, they're getting these uh, scholastic reader and they can't read it. Well, right. the other kids are reading it. They can't read it. It's not at a third grade level considered, you know, when, when they're doing a DRA. So, um, you know, I, I'd be interested in how you, how do you handle that when you hear that le grade leveling, Nancy? So, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question also in terms of um, the parent's goal is to have their child reach their full potential, as it should be. That's all of, all of us parents have that goal for our kids. Um, but as I mentioned before, the district's job is to keep them at or near grade level, right? I mean, that's the, the, the goal of public education is to have them be following the third grade curriculum and master the third grade curriculum and move on to fourth grade. Um, so I, it's actually a question, I'm going to punt it back to you in a second, because I feel like um, districts generally know much more about helping the special ed child, um, helping the child who needs services, helping the child who's below their peers and helping them to catch up. Um, they don't really do so much in terms of the gifted child or the advanced child and you know kind of enrichment and differentiation on the on the upper end um, and I don't know the question I'm putting back to you is what is their legal requirement to do that you know do, is there a legal requirement for them to educate a child above their grade level I mean they do have to take into consider if you have a child who has a 120 IQ and they're skimming grade level with three days a week of OG tutoring that their parents have been providing at home and pull out reading. Right. You know, they can't just say there's no problem because right. this child happens. You know, it, it, it is connected mm -hmm. to the child's potential. They don't have to maximize your potential on the public dime, right? So right. Uh, you get a free appropriate public education. You don't get a free the best possible education you could Correct. have. So yeah, that's there, there is a tension there, but they do have to educate you based on what your individual needs are and your individual abilities are, and they can't just ignore that. I mean, they do sometimes, but they're not supposed to ignore that. Or uh, likewise, if the child is having in, in incredible anxiety or uh, behavioral issues or social issues, but they're at grade level in terms of their academics, Right. They shouldn't be failing to provide services and supports to teach the child in the area of need, in those behavioral, emotional um, domains, because that's part of what allows us to be successful and, and live full and, and rich lives. And mm -hmm. it isn't just, you know, getting a B or a C on a chemistry test. Absolutely. My email address is still on the screen, so if you have questions for me, I'm very quick on email. Um, you can definitely email me later. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I, I suspect my son has dysgraphia. Uh, dysgraphia. He is um, age five and has ADHD and dyslexia. He has all the classic signs of dysgraphia. He's had an OT evaluation but doesn't seem to qualify for services. Um, so what can I request to help him? So with um, writing, I think with dysgraphia, I would look at two pieces, the, the OT assessment. I mean, you may want to request if that OT, OT evaluations really vary depending on the OT. And I see, 
you know, lots of different reports, including lots of different measures that they did or did not do. Um, so you could ask for a second opinion with an OT evaluation. I don't know if, I haven't seen this done, but um, Denise and Norma might know that they could do an independent assessment reeval of the OT piece, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and then also looking at what are the writing tests that have been administered um, and who interpreted those writing tests. And did they look at not just the content of, you know, the spelling test, but also how did the words look on the page? Were they on the lines? Were they, was it jumbled? Is the handwriting legible? Um, did they produce a story that made sense? Um, so looking at it from the writing side as well, from a learning piece, um, because the dysgraphia is, you know, it, it kind of both things go hand in hand. You have to be able to get your words out on paper physically as well as, you know, through your thought process and organization on the page. Um, so I would recommend looking a little deeper into the writing assessment that's been done recently and possibly a second opinion on the OT evaluation. Child um, diagnosed with Asperger syndrome and from a developmental, uh, from a developmental pediatrician and the parent is um, trying to find a way to um, advocate and uh, to get the right evaluation, they feel pragmatic language is something that is um, going to he's going to need. And it's right for him. But the child study team performed an evaluation and another independent evaluation that all came with average or a little bit below average. Okay. So one thing that I would look at is um, using something called a test of pragmatic language. So pragmatic language is sometimes assessed by speech and language therapists um, in, in a, on a child study team, not, uh, not always, and independent evaluators also don't always look at language and don't always look at pragmatic language. It's a very specific area of language processing. And a lot of times uh, you think about pragmatic language and, you know, a child on the spectrum who has, you know, the obvious, you know, social challenges and those things that are the hallmark of a spectrum disorder. Um, but what I find is that, first of all, schools should be doing something about that because that child can't just be alone at recess or alone at lunch or unable to work on a group project because the communication with their peers is difficult. I mean, there's clearly an impairment, um, you know, could, could be an impairment to a child's functioning throughout the school day in lots of different settings. So I, I 100% percent feel that that falls under the purview of what the child study team should be, you know, looking at and addressing and understanding. Um, so again, when they're just looking at a Woodcock Johnson or an IQ test and say, yep, you know, this child's fine, we're all, we're all good here. Um, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I feel like, you know, definitely needs a closer look. Um, the other piece that I find with kids on the spectrum, and, you know, depending on how old your child is, um, I find that often, not always, this is generalization, but um, often what the pragmatic language and the language processing or even, you know, kind of abstract reasoning um, falls into is um, the category of looking at the higher academic skills. So kids on the spectrum, again, not always, but will often do fine in early elementary school because, you know, Every, there's a routine, um, the you know, math worksheet on Tuesday looks just like the math sheet that they got last Tuesday. So there's, you know, rote, rote learning and sort of routinized learning. Um, they hear something and then they kind of put it back out on a test. Um, and kids on the spectrum can often do that pretty well um, or very well. And then uh, when they get to middle school, all of a sudden they can't analyze a work of fiction that requires understanding characters and characters' feelings and characters' motives. Um, so when they start to have trouble in a history class or on a history essay or in a literature class. Um, they have trouble sometimes with written expression. They can write, you know, um, write an essay on a test really well, but they can't write a persuasive essay because that requires pragmatic language aspects or they can't um, write a creative story or a poem or, you know, depends on what their language profile looks like. So I feel like I would go back to the, you know, getting a really good language assessment and trying to understand that pragmatic piece and then looking for ways that it is impacting their social functioning at school or even their academic functioning, again, depending on what grade level your child is in. Is it impacting reading comprehension? Is it impacting their ability to do well on an assignment when it's not like every other assignment that they saw the week before and you're throwing something new at them. Um, can they can they figure that out? Can they think on their feet and, and apply what they know? Okay. I mean, I would also add that if the child is being followed by a private psychologist um, and or psychiatrist, neurologist, those professionals can also add their voices to what the student needs, um, social, emotional, um, and you know, sometimes the child may be able to answer the questions and under, they understand what they need to do socially, but not do it, not, not 
do it when it's in the natural course, even though right. they can intellectually know how to do it. And I think that you, you want all the people that are involved with the student to write to the school district to say that this child does not have friends, you know, if it's whatever's true, obviously they don't have friends in the school or they have uh, very rigid thinking and or they're getting in trouble because of the way they're interacting with the teacher and that they require, that they need social skills programming um, that it focuses on pragmatic language, it focuses on understanding when you're getting frustrated, on you know how your engine is revving, for lack of a better word, and um, being able to control when you start feeling those feelings before it gets out of out of hand. Those are things the school should be working on, and just because the child is testing, you know, in a way that's average, doesn't mean that they're not struggling. And those things, those pieces are the pieces we all need in order to lead happy and fulfilled lives. We can't, you know, go to work and say, oh, you know, we don't feel like going today or we're going to show up late or we don't like what the boss said, so we're going to just tell him that in his face or her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those are those pieces are, are essential pieces and the, the law provides that this child be educated in the in the breadth of the education based on the disability. And so you know, if I had a dime for every IEP of a child with Asperger who had math goals and science goals and social studies goals and they don't have a learning disability and they don't have an issue with those things and then the goals are that they'll turn in their homework and that they'll organize their backpack but then there are absolutely no services being provided to that student to teach them how to do that so that I don't know how it's ever going to happen and they're going to learn one day miraculously to do those things so you know you have to focus on where the need is what the what the disability is and provide the services that that child requires to make meaningful progress in the areas that are impacted by their disability so, um, you know, a comprehensive evaluation, I know, you know, what, what Nancy would be doing would be looking at the testing, but would also be looking at all of these functional um, needs of the student and certainly the private therapist that's providing therapy or psychiatrists, neurologists, people that are, are interacting and understand the child and have a history with the child can also um, provide valuable information. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We're uh, really happy to have been able to bring this webinar to you. Uh, we have one more webinar next Thursday, 1230 to 1.30, um, focusing on goals and objectives in the IEP. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you so much.